Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray all is well with you today. Thanks for joining me. Today, I need to bring a message to you that the Lord laid on my heart a few days ago. We're going to be looking at Isaiah 42 and the first four verses. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. One of the great passages in the Old Testament prophesying the coming of Christ. And I know at this holiday season, a lot of times we're hearing the standard um sermons, the standard passages on Christ's birth and the story of the wise men and so on and so on. And I've preached on that before, but Lord led me to this passage. And I think for the next several weeks through the end of this year, I'll be preaching from portions of Isaiah 42. So let's move on to Isaiah 42. And I, I want you to see, and I'm going to show you through the New Testament that this is really talking about Jesus. Although he's not mentioned by name, we will see that it is confirmed in the New Testament. I titled my sermon, the first three words, actually, of Isaiah 42, Behold My Servant. So I'm going to read a verse, we'll talk about it, we'll define it a little bit, and I pray that you will be blessed by this message today. Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. You'll notice the name of Jesus is not mentioned. So let's define some of these words as God is talking about as they were in the Old Testament. And then we'll see how they apply to the New Testament. First of all, Isaiah starts off saying, behold, behold, look. That's what he's saying. Look, behold, pay attention. I'm telling you something important. Behold, my servant Servant, I suggest to you, is Jesus. You know, Jesus came as a servant. He came as many things, but he also came as a servant. So Isaiah the prophet, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold. Uphold means to, to grasp, to support, to, uh, to lift up, to hold on to. Mine elect is the next phrase elect, chosen, that which God has chosen. And Jesus, of course, was chosen to be the perfect sacrifice for us on the cross at Calvary. He was fully God and he was fully man, but he was without sin. And so his sacrifice on the cross was the perfect sacrifice. He was whom God elected to pay the sins for us. Then it says, I have put my spirit upon him. What spirit is he talking about? The Holy Spirit, of course. And we're going to see that in a moment. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now, when we're talking about judgment, we have to be careful how God defines judgment, okay? And judgment, in this context, is talking about justice or righteousness. In other words, what Christ was going to bring was he was going to bring people into a right relationship with God through himself and also a right relationship with each other. Remember when the uh, the smart aleck teacher came to him, remember he came and he said, teacher, what is the greatest commandments in all of the law? What did Jesus say? He said the first two things that we're looking at right here. He said the first thing you do is you love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul. The second thing is you love others as yourself. They're the two greatest commandments. He said on that, everything else hangs on those two things. Well, when we look at the word judgment here and what Jesus is going to do, we look at it as not so much judgment is in condemnation, but as in righteousness, that, that he was going to bring people back through himself to a re right relationship with God and with each other. And as we read through the Gospels, that's exactly what Jesus did. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I and my Father are one. Jesus made statement after statement after statement that said, I am the way back to God. I am that bridge you're looking for. And so as we're looking at this, it was written hundreds of years before Jesus even came. It says, he shall bring judgment. And then it says, to who? To the Gentiles. That means the nations. Remember, Jesus came to his own and his own refused him. Remember? Of course he did. Jesus came to his own people and his people rejected him. They wanted him dead. And so the gospel spread out to the Gentiles. Gentiles in this 
in, in this context just means the nations, the nations of the world. It's reaching us today. We're talking about this passage today. Wherever you are watching this, you are part of the Gentiles. You are part of the nations. So, as I said, Jesus himself was not mentioned here, but I can show you that this is Jesus being spoken about. But let me do one more verse before we move over to Matthew. In verse 2, the Bible says, He shall not cry nor lift up. Now, I'm reading from King James. He shall not cry nor lift up. What is God talking about? Well, simply this. He shall not cry, meaning Jesus is not going to shout and scream and yell. If you'll notice through his ministry, yes, he got upset in the temple when he had to chase the, the, uh, the money changers out of the temple. But ordinarily, he spoke. He talked. He teached. That's what he did. He would teach his people. He would get in a boat and teach to the crowds. He'd stand on a mount and preach the sermon on the mount. He didn't cry out. He didn't shout. And it says he didn't lift up. In other words, he didn't raise his voice. I'm not saying there's anything bad about raising your voice. If you happen to be a preacher or a teacher that you shout or you raise your voice, that's your style. What I'm saying is this is what the Bible is saying about Jesus. He came meekly. Remember? He was meek. He was humble. He was quiet. He got his point across. He said what he needed to say. He didn't make a big show of it. He, he came being meek and humble. In other words, he came without fanfare. Remember? Now, the other phrase we see in verse 2 says, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Basically, he went, Jesus went about his work quietly. As we look at his ministry, didn't he, he go from city to city just preaching the gospel? Even when he was in the synagogue and he read that portion from Isaiah, and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He wasn't shouting. He wasn't jumping up and down. He quietly told them, I'm the fulfillment of this. It was the people that got up in arms and get into the street and went to the Romans and say, we need him crucified. We need him out of here. This guy's a troublemaker. He claims to be the son of God. It was the people that got stirred up. He was simply preaching the truth. He didn't cause his voice to raise up and be heard in the street. He went about his work quietly and meekly. He wasn't being loud. He wasn't ostentatious. If you remember, when he came in to Jerusalem, what was he doing? He was riding on a donkey. Remember? Very humbly. He wasn't riding on a beautiful, magnificent horse. The people were the ones that were stirred up, throwing the palms down and, and claiming, you know, he was the great, he was the great uh, deliverer for all of them. He was going to deliver them from Roman oppression. Jesus came in humbly and meekly on the donkey into Jerusalem. Jesus made his point, but he didn't have to be a loud mouth to do it. He didn't have to carry on to do it. These are some of the characteristics that Jesus had as described by Isaiah. Let me show you, before we move on to verse 3, exactly what I'm talking about and why I tell you this is Jesus. First of all, go with me to Matthew chapter 3. I want you to see, and perhaps I should have done this when we did verse 1, because in Matthew 3, remember when Jesus was baptized in Matthew 3, we read this in Matthew chapter 3 when he got baptized by John the Baptist in verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Notice the phrase in verse 16 when he says he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. When we go back to Isaiah 42, 1, it says what? I have put my Spirit upon him. That's a proof text that this is Jesus that he's talking about, especially when we look at everything else here that Jesus is going to do. Before I take you to Matthew 12, I want you to see what Isaiah is talking about in verse 42, 3. Some people don't understand what these phrases are, and I hope to be able to unlock that for you. Verse 3 of Isaiah 42 says this, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. We'll get to judgment in a moment. Do you ever wonder what this means? What does a bruised reed mean? Well, we know a, a reed was a water-based plant that grew near bodies of water. Reeds were usually very tall and very thin. Reeds. You've all seen reeds, I'm sure. But what he's talking about with a bruised reed is a reed that may have been crushed 
or broken a little bit or trampled on maybe by an animal, maybe blown over by the wind. In other words, it wasn't a perfect read. It wasn't perfectly healthy, standing straight up, taking in the sun, taking in the water. It was bruised in some way. It was hurting. That's the point. It was hurting. So what Jesus is, is what Isaiah is telling about Jesus, a bruised reed, he shall not break. What does that mean? It, it means that Jesus is coming for those who are hurting, those who are damaged, those who have been beat up, those, he's not going to break it. In other words, if picture yourself as, as a reed. I, I was a reed. I was broken, lonely, depressed. Jesus came along and he healed all of that and brought me into a right relationship with him. That's what, that's what this metaphor is talking about. Okay. It's a bruised reed. He won't break. Jesus didn't come to break people down. He came, he came to build people up. He came to bring them into what? Judgment or justice, a right relationship. That's me also, Rochelle. Yep. That's what he did for me. I was bruised and broken and battered and knocked down, not dead. But I was hurting. And that's what Jesus came to do. A bruised reed shall he not break. But watch this. Here's another metaphor that God is using. And the smoking flax shall be not quenched. What in the world does that mean? Think of it this way. In those times, they had oil burning lamps with a wick. And you would fill up the lamp with oil. You know, Jesus talked about, make sure you have oil for your lamps. Okay, so a smoking flax, the flax was the wick. The smoking part is, you know, when you light a candle and you deprive it of air, it starts smoking more because it's dying. It's lacking oxygen. It needs to breathe. So when he says smoking flax, he's talking about, okay, if you're a broken reed, I'm not going to break you. If you're a smoking flax, if your life is almost snuffed out, if you're dying, not physically, if you're dying spiritually, if you are so low that your flame is about to go out, you've lost all hope. You've lost everything. That's what Jesus is talking about here, or Isaiah should say about Jesus. A smoking flax, he will not quench. Jesus didn't come to destroy people. He came to help people. He came to heal people. He came to show a right relationship. This is what you need to do to get back to God. You got to come through me and I'm here to help you, to build you up. If you're a smoking flax, I'm not going to blow out the candle. If you're a bruised reed, I'm not going to squash you and st stomp on you. That's not what Jesus came to do. Now, a he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Yes, he did. But he, he was, he was God and he was trying to tell the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the other unbelievers that he was the way, the only way. A lot of people didn't want to believe him. Even, even today, there's a lot of people that don't want to believe that Jesus is the only way. They don't accept him as Messiah. Look at the graciousness. Look at the love that Jesus had. He said, if you're a bruised reed, I will not break you. If you're a smoking flax, if your candle's about to go out, if you're dying for air, if you're having a hard time, I'm not going to blow you out. I won't quench that. I'm going to build that up. These metaphors, look, let's face it. These metaphors that we're talking about in verse 3 speak of the, those who are vulnerable, those who are hungry, the homeless, the persecuted. And Jesus demonstrated this during his ministry, didn't he? Look, did he heal the sick? Did he touch the infirmed? Did he give hope to the hopeless? Did he bring hope and peace to people? Did he say, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world? Yes, he did. Did he say, I go to build many mansions in my father's house. There are many mansions and I'm preparing a place for you. And if I prepare a place, I'm coming back for you. That is not someone who is going to destroy a bruised reed or blow out a smoking flax. That is someone who's going to help us. But he came as a servant. He came as a servant to do what God had called him to do. Now, you'll notice here in the end, at the end of verse 3, the word judgment comes up again. It's very important. Here's a biblical principle, and you, I'm sure you know this. Everything that God says in the Bible is true. If God says it more than once, it's, you better pay attention. 
because God is trying to tell us something. So we saw the word judgment in verse 1. We're now seeing it again in verse 3. We already know what judgment is. He's talking about righteousness, bringing us into a right relationship. Jesus wants and desires justice for those poor, the spiritually poor, the weak, the vulnerable, all those that, that get, get tossed aside. Jesus came for them. He came for everybody who's broken. And guess what? That's every human being. Every human being is broken in one way or another. We're all broken. Jesus came for all of us. Remember he said he didn't come for those who were well. He came for those who were sinners. That's all of us. To whatever degree God finds us. God is not out to destroy us. God is giving us his love through his son Jesus. The servant is what we're looking at today. So before we move on to verse 4 and the final verse, I want to show you that this is about Jesus. Go with me to Matthew 12. There's a passage in Matthew 12. Matthew, of course, was one of the disciples, one of the apostles that followed Jesus. And the passage in Matthew 12 is talking about Jesus. The whole passage is talking about Jesus, okay? It says here, let me start with verse 14 of Matthew 12, and then I'm going to read through a few verses so you see the connection. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Bruised reed, smoking flax. He healed them. And he charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and here's the quote, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax he shall not quench, till he has sent forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. There it is. What Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus got here was fulfilled when Jesus was here. Because Matthew, one of his disciples, said, this is what Isaiah said he was going to do. And you know what? I'm a Gentile. I came out of the nations. I believe in Christ. The Bible just said, I'll put my trust in Christ. And I do. And if you came out of the Gentile nations... You're a believer in Christ. Is this scripture true? Is this Jesus the servant we're talking about? Jesus came to serve. He didn't come to be served. He said he came to serve. And we see here, Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant, Jesus. He can only be talking about Jesus. Let's move on to verse 4 of Isaiah 42. Let's finish this passage up. He shall not fail nor be discouraged. Not fail or be discouraged. What does that mean? He won't be broken. He won't be defeated. He can't be defeated. He's on a mission. He's on what God elected him to do and chose him to do and sent him to do. You cannot defeat Jesus. Satan is defeated, but Jesus cannot be defeated. He can't be discouraged. You can't, you can't break Jesus. Then it says, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth. When we think about set, the word set, think about, bring it about, make it happen, establish it. It is set. We hear the phrase, it's, it's set in stone. It's there when he sets judgment. Again, this is the third time the word judgment is mentioned. It's repeated again. Hear me. It's repeated again so we don't miss the point. What did Jesus come for? Did he come for just judgment? No, he came for righteousness. He came his righteousness. He paid on the cross for our sins with his righteousness, not ours. He paid on the cross for our sins because he was holy before God and sinless, not because we were, because we're not. He came to bring us into a right relationship with God as a bridge on the way back to God to be reconciled. So three times we see in just these four verses the word judgment. Remember, it means justice, it means righteousness, it means bringing us back into a right relationship with God. And yes, very often that means chastisement. That means God has to 
knock us upside the head. That means sometimes he lets us go through sin and then pulls us back and say, I just saved you from going over the, going over the cliff. You were a bruised reed. I didn't break you. I saved you. You were a smoking flax. And instead of your flame dying out, I gave you new flame. I gave you new oxygen. I let you burn again, but you're burning for me and not for the world. So you'll notice here at the end, it says, till he has set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Isles. It's another word for coastline. It's another word for Gentiles. Just another word, isles. You have to remember in the context that this was written, this was written for the Jews in the promised land in Canaan. When you talk about the nations, there were nations all around Israel, of course. There was still the rest of the world to be discovered at that point. And so when he's talking about isles, we're talking about coastlines, Gentiles. Anyone outside of national Israel is what we're talking about here. So behold my servant. I have to ask you this. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Is he the servant that, that came into your life at some point, wherever, wherever you are, are you saved? Is Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, here in this holiday season, we will be celebrating very shortly the birth of our Savior. Now, we all know that December 25th was not the actual day that Jesus was born. As a matter of fact, most Bible scholars think it was closer to early October. Be that as it may, that's a minor point of contention. The point is that Jesus was actually born. He was born and 33 years later, he suffered and died on the cross for all those who would believe in him. Do you believe in Jesus today? Is he your Lord and Savior? If he is, I rejoice with you, not just because we're in the Christmas season, but because you have eternal life. Your sins have been forgiven. The servant came and paid the price for you. If you don't know Jesus, today, the Bible says, is still the day of salvation. It's not too late. As long as you have a breath in your body, as long as you have a breath in your body, as long as you're on this side of the grave, there's a chance of being saved. Once you take your last breath, there's no more chance. It's done. I, I, I beseech you that if you don't know Christ today, call out to him. Call out to God. Lord, I'm a sinner. I need salvation. I need you to be the Lord of my life. Bring your case before the Lord. Bring your case before the servant, Jesus Christ. Let him build up. Are you a bruised reed today? Let him build you back up. Are you a smoking flax today? Let him give you new life, new breath. I promise you, your life will never be the same again once Jesus is your Lord and Savior. I pray that this message today has brought you some comfort. Uh, maybe you learned something. Maybe you were convicted. If this has been any help to you at all and you wish to share it, please feel free to do so. This has nothing to do with me uh, or the ministry or the, the church. This has to do with the Word of God. None of us deserve any kind of recognition. All the glory should go to God alone. So if this has blessed you, please feel free to share it. Someone who needs to hear the message. Someone who may be hurting right now. Or bruised. Someone who's on their last leg. Someone who needs some hope. There's hope in Jesus. Send this message to them. You can send this. Anything that I post, this is for God's glory, not mine. I thank you for joining me today. God bless you.